Hi, my name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WetPixel, and I'd like to welcome you to WetPixel Live. Um, I'm joined today by my regular correspondent, our regular contributor, um, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Nice to be here. Um, and Alex is going to talk about sex today. <laughs> Yeah, that's not quite the introduction I, I was um, wanting, but yeah, that, that's great. Yeah. Um, um, in fact, in fact, really thrown me with that one. I'll, in, I'm in, fact, here. in fact, even more, he's going to talk about ph photographing sex, which isn't better. Yeah, no, I, I, have to admit, I am rather addicted to it as well. But I, I think the, the attraction of, 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 of photographing sex underwater is, is manifold. Is, is, first of all, Sex underwater is, is very creative. Uh, I don't want this to become a, a double entendre label um, no. laden episode. But actually, one of the really exciting things about, about being a wildlife photographer, you know, shooting underwater, is we we work with this really diverse, um, the, the very diverse community of animals that we're photographing. And because our animals are all very different, their behaviours are all really really different. And just to put, put you know, if you are a, a photographer in you know Africa and you photograph big game in Africa the majority of your your subjects are mammals and those mammals all reproduce in the same way so for you you know photographing mating behaviors reproductive behaviors is quite samey yeah. underwater a coral a sponge a you know a, a shrimp a, a sea slug a fish a shark right. a dolphin all reproduce in very different ways. So our stories are really, really diverse. And un life underwater is has these very, very different types of animals in it. So, so we have this great tapestry to shoot from. And that's part of the attraction. I also love behavior photography because I think it really challenges us as a wildlife photographer, as nature photographers, in perhaps the purest way. Because like any nature photographer, you've got to be able to sort of get yourself in front of the subjects. Yep. You've then got to have some knowledge about the subjects. And I think, you know, I have fe always felt that there's always, you know, throughout wildlife photography in general, particularly underwater, there are photographers who just take pictures of what they're told to take pictures of without much knowledge of what they are. And that's absolutely fine for creating beautiful pictures. But I think if you actually do know something about what you're photographing, chasing behavior is a great way of making your picture stand out from everyone else. Yep. And then... Finally, I, I've always loved the fact that in behavior photography, if you want natural behavior to play out in front of you, it's not something you can force as a photographer. And in an age when, you know, we're aware that, you know, some photographers maybe, you know, take pictures that are ethically a bit dubious. One of the yep. great things about behavior photography is you don't get these shots unless you play by the animal's rules. Yep. And I, I really like having these images in my portfolio not only because I, I love showing these these aspects of their lives that very few people have ever seen, but also it, it has this kind of subtext that I go about my photography in the right way, which is a message that's nice to 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 put out there. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, I thought I'd put up some pictures. So um, the reason I had these pictures knocking around is that um, it, it, um, in, in December 2020, I spoke on this subject in a big European wildlife photography event called nature talks and normally that's a big gathering of photographers from 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 all all around the world in terms of the speakers but but from around europe really in terms of the attendees in the netherlands in, in, in these sort of winter months and you have all this, this nice program of talks being 2020 it's all done virtually yeah. and um so i didn't get to go to the festival this year but it was really interesting i think one of the things that i really liked about the way they did the festival is the talks are, and the whole festival content is online for about three months. So you didn't have to watch it all on the evening. And actually doing it in December, just before the holidays, it's actually really nice that people know that they've got all these really interesting talks to, you know. So while the rest of the family is busy watching James Bond, they can, you know, they can get their, their laptop out and maybe watch a, a, a nature photography talk. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's a really nice, um, nice thing to do. Um, and I guess people also maybe while watching catching up with their wet pixel lives over Christmas. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was um, going to, so what I wanted to do was sort of show you a few, I think I showed about 100 pictures in the talk, and these are just a few of them, and yep. I just thought it was nice to talk about, about behavior photography, particularly sex photography. So um, the first picture is this one here, which is kind of, for me, the 
the picture that launched this type of photography for me. It's a pair of shy hamlets spawning in the Cayman Islands. Mm. And this was my first picture that was awarded in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Yeah. I took the picture back in 2004, I think, or 2003. But I'd been photographing hamlets for about two or three years before that. Yeah. And I, I got inspired to take this picture because um, I'd seen in scientific literature this really interesting behavior. The scientists had photographed it in aquariums. Right. And I, I, I sort of re and it was the first picture I ever sort of realized. I thought if I can get that behavior captured in camera in the wild, yeah. that's a picture that could do really well for me. And no one has ever done a, a beautiful shot of this before. Yeah. And so my goal was to learn how to see it and then to find the prettiest species and to capture the perfect pose. So it was yeah. a relatively simple photographic process. It just took an incredibly long time. Um, yeah. And the main reason, there were loads of obstacles in, in producing, I won't bore you with now, but I remember having this image in my mind for about four years. Yeah. And it wasn't that I didn't know how to take it. It was actually a lot of it was just getting the opportunity to take it. Getting it in the right place, yeah. That, yeah, and it's the only picture that, at the time that I took this picture, I felt I was going to win something in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year with it. And at that time, I'd never won in the competition. And I think, and I've never had that feeling about any of my other winning pictures in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. So I think that's 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 really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the colour uh, palette's beautiful. So you know. the second one shows a pair of anemone fish spawning. And I think if you want to get into photographing fish and, and um, spawning behaviors underwater, egg laying species are the best place to start, yep. particularly species like damselfish that seem, you know, a, a total exhibitionists. You can swim right up to them underwater and, and kind of they just carry on doing things. Yep. And anemone fish are a part of the damselfish family. But for years and years, I really struggled to get photos of them spawning. And I couldn't crack the code as to as to why I wasn't getting these shots and, and not many other people were getting these shots either. There aren't, you know, there's millions of pictures of damselfish laying eggs, very yeah. few of anemone fish. And what I learned is that anemone fish, because they have to come out of their anemone to lay eggs on the rocks, they're yeah. very shy about doing it, which is quite surprising because once they've laid the eggs, they can defend them incredibly aggressively. Yeah. But they're very shy about the process of coming out and perhaps they feel vulnerable to predators or, or something like that. It must um, and, it, yeah. and, and as a result, what I realized is I'd been missing this behavior because every time I saw an enemy fish with new eggs and you can spot an enemy fish when they've got new eggs because they're strongly colored, they become more silvery over time. Yeah. Um, I now, as soon as I see an enemy fish with, with brightly colored eggs, I back away and give the anemone fish a chance to relax me being there and see if they're coming out to spawn. And the mistake I was making for years is, is when I saw an enemy fish with colorful eggs, I thought, oh, they finished laying. I'll go in and get some photos of their nice new eggs. Mm -hmm. And actually what I should have been doing was backing away and checking that they really had finished spawning. Yeah. Because um, actually I think they spawn over quite a long period, maybe an hour or so yeah. during the day. And it's very easy to catch them in the process but yeah. not see it because your presence actually stops them doing it and yeah. learning to back away. And I think something I really like about behavior photography is you learn these little bits of field craft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With egg laying species, if we go on to the next slide now, this is an anemone fish guarding eggs. Yeah. With egg laying species, there's a lot of parental care behaviors that follow on from the actual spawning that are perhaps the even easier still to get into photographically because yeah. they go on over a long, much longer window and the subject matter tends to be very sight attached. And I think like this picture here, you can then, with that reliability, start to take your photography in more artistic areas. So this is a picture that's not really about showing the behavior so much as trying to show that behavior, but at the same time create a really stunning, beautiful image. Yeah. And I think that's, that's an important part of this. There's no point having an amazing portfolio of behavior images that no one wants to look at because they're not visually appealing. Yep. And I think one of the challenges of being a good behavior photographer is creating images that capture the natural behavior, but also a graphic eye catching and engaging visually as photographs as well. And then the behavior is kind of supercharging them as opposed to you've got this kind of fairly boring visual image that's only got behavior as a selling point. 
I, I think that's a, a common mistake amongst photographers is is to you know it, it, behavior is fascinating and they often want to capture it or document it but there's a difference between documenting behavior and, and then documenting in a way that's visually appealing um, and I think that the trick is to try and combine the two and obviously um, they, I mean there to, to be honest there are lots of pictures of um, an enemy fish guarding eggs or, or, or um, looking after their eggs um, but I mean the way that this is captured with the with the, the cutout on the side of the enemy fish um, and, and the, the way it's focused make it very visually appealing and that's that's mm -hmm. the that's the goal here it's not just to capture a picture of fish eggs it's to capture a picture mm -hmm. of fish eggs that looks look stunning so yeah 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 yeah, the shot with the trio pan lens. Right, move on to the next one because I'm going a bit slowly. Um, the next one is one where I say the behaviour is kind of an accent on the image. The next picture is a weedy sea dragon in a kelp forest in Tasmania. And the behaviour accent here is is that it's a male sea dragon um, holding eggs. And I would have taken this picture had the male not been holding the eggs, but I probably, it would have just been okay, it's an average picture. And I like that you've got the extra layer of interest. So behavior can, in this case, it's not what the picture's about. It's not a behavior picture. It's very right. much an animal in its environment picture, but it's got that behavior there as an accent to give that extra interest. Yep. Um, right, the, the, the next picture I'm gonna show is a pair of surgeon fish, a pair of um, yellow-tailed surgeon fish spawning. And this is my luckiest behavior shot. Um, and it's a real favorite of mine. Um, because it's a, it's a complete fluky shot in that I was trying to photograph these guys' courtship. I'd never been able to capture them um, spawning before because they spawn at 100 miles an hour. They they swim so fast. This is not a long exposure, but it looks like one because the fish are moving so fast through the frame. Right. And I was photographing their courtship where they swim relatively fast, but you can just about get shots of them. And yep. then at the end of their courtship, they dart up into the water column, flip belly to belly and spawn. And yep. I'd never captured this. I never had any intention thinking I'd be able to capture it. Yep. And on this occasion, I, you know, they did, they raced up. I pointed my camera at them and completely fortuitously to me, they turned towards the camera and swam into focus right at the moment I pressed the shutter. And right. it, you know, not, still, but as a result, it's a, an amazing picture. It's one that I know I would never be able to repeat. Um, and so I, I love it from that perspective. And I always enjoy showing it in this portfolio of work. Yeah. Um, the next two pictures it's, I'm going to show. Um, sorry, Adam. It, it may. I mean, I think sometimes as well with with behaviour pictures, possibly you know, we because we're capturing behaviour, it's one. They are the types of images where you basically get the fish swim into shot. You get it set up and you let the, and, and 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 you shoot away and you hopefully get something. Um, you know, it, it's it, there are obviously different behaviours, but certainly mated behaviours often quite quick. So so it is something where where. The slightly more. I mean, spraying prey is not true because that's not what you're doing because you're com you're actually composing it mentally. I, I was praying though, and I probably wasn't praying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, all right. I, but I think I think you've got to get it set up right in order to get the result you want out of it. But yeah. Um. When when it comes to pressing the shutter, you're probably choosing as fast as you can and and seeing what you get afterwards. Yeah. Sorry, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I mean, I, I have to. I tend not to use the rapid fire approach with 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 these shots. A lot of the spawning behaviour I photograph happens in low light around dusk, and actually most of the time you're just waiting to just you know the camera's struggling to focus. You're struggling to get it in the frame. You're trying to stay really really still in the water because you know you need to keep your presence yeah. very minimal so the animal's behavior doesn't get affected. And yeah. I think those are things I'm fo fo focusing on more, and then I'm trying to time a shot. You know, some species like mandarin fish, they have quite long spawning rises. They're yeah. slow swimming, easy to shoot. Yeah. Um, but a lot of fish don't. And also, you know, taking another picture of mandarin fish spawning is not really diversifying your portfolio. There's, you know, hundreds of thousands of species in the ocean that we can shoot as well, but they're not all as easy as mandarin fish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Um, the next shot, oh, next two shots I'm going to show um, are actually the, the first shot is a school of 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 jacks gathering at spawning time in the Red Sea, school of of of, um, of Big Eye Trevally, and this is a shot that's not about really so much the behaviour of this shot. It's the fact that I was chasing sex chasing spawning aggregations that gave this opportunity and i think particularly when you chase the bigger spawning aggregations around the world plan your trips around them chase them as, as destinations you give yourself the opportunity to take some really phenomenal pictures yeah. and so although you know th this comes from my passion 
for shooting behavior and wanting to time my diving around behavior events. Yeah. But often those big behavior events can give you some really great images. You know, you think about the the sharks feeding on the groupers in Fakarava or something like that. You know, yeah. people are going there really for the predators on the on the spawning behavior. The yeah. whale sharks in Isla Mujeres. Yeah. You know, you go there not for the skipjack tuna spawning. You go there yeah. for all the egg predators that that draws in. Yeah. And so yeah, chasing these events and actually paying attention to the rhythms, the timing of the ocean, going to the right place in the right time can really pay our photography back, even if actually the behavior that we're chasing, the behavior itself isn't our main photographic goal. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, gatherings of fish, gatherings of predators, gatherings of eggs feeders are all really good types of photography. Yeah, well, oftentimes we're capturing the, the, the effect rather than the cause, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah but that's yeah. all part of, you know, yeah. being in tune with, with nature yeah. in the ocean and not just, you know, um, not just shooting, you know, just blindly chasing, you know, whatever animal it was is actually understanding what you're shooting. Yeah, um, wonderful. This penultimate shot is a pair of salmon spawning in a river in British Columbia, shot as a split level. Um, the female is the one forward and the, the male is the one behind in their red on, on the, the seabed there. On the, on the riverbed and this is a fantastic shot um, shoot that I really enjoyed doing with Todd Mintz. We got our permissions from the um, you know Canadian departments that we needed of fisheries and and, and, and that sort of thing to, to be in the rivers with the salmon and, and do the photography and it was a really really enjoyable very hard work shoot. The rivers were cold and they were quite flooded with water when we went there so it was physically very hard staying still in the water all the time doing these pictures because you were you were basically freezing cold all day and yeah. being pulled and you stank because the rivers salmon are one of those species that die after they spawn so there's yeah. lots and lots of dead salmon and we yeah. went in the the biggest salmon year for like a decade so it was like there was loads of salmon it's amazing to see amazing yeah. natural history experience but yeah an assault on the senses so these pictures have always been favorites of mine and this one here i just shot as a split level um with the backlit forest behind because I wanted to give a connection of the environment that these fish that normally live in the sea have come into to spawn. So the environment was a really key part of the story for me in this one. Yeah. yeah. And then the final picture is, is one of my shots of coral spawning, which definitely remain my favorite images um, that I've photographed, really because I poured so much of, of myself into this. And I think that's really... You know, photography, yes, it's about impressing other people, but it's yeah. also about satisfying yourself. And I love these pictures because they're incredibly rewarding for me to have taken because yeah. of how much effort went into them. Um, this picture here, um, no one had ever seen corals, mass coral spawning in the Cayman Islands until I, um, nearly 20 years ago now, when I was working as a scientist, did some predictions that allowed us to see them. And yeah. that was amazing to be the first people to see them. And then for several years, I went back and shot them and really learned exactly all the details of the process to not only be able to predict when the reef is going to spawn, but also to have a really good understanding of when individual coral colonies are going to spawn. Yep. And this was the, the first time I'd returned after about five or six years of not shooting it and went back and was able to produce this image here using sort of an advanced technique, using an off-camera strobe that at the time I took this picture, very few people were using. Certainly no one was using them in natural history photography. Yeah. And all those things coming together, shooting wide angle at night, and this being based on my own predictions, made this a very personally satisfying picture. And I think that was my closing comment on behavior photography, is that it can be some of the most personally satisfying images that you take because of the fact it's not just you're going down there and shooting what someone points you to shoot. You're actually understanding something about the animal, understanding something about the rhythms of its life and diving in a way that's not disturbing it, um, you know, particularly with the fish. And yeah. you therefore produce. And then if you can create an eye catching, beautiful image, incorporating all of that, it can be incredibly satisfying and yeah. really, really pleasing. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, what a wonderful array of um, sex pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, wonderful. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, how do you can you tag? I don't suppose you can really tag behavior. Do you tag behavior as a tag in your imagery? Yeah. yeah. So on my website, amustard.com, I have a search field on there. Yeah. If you if you type words like spawn, 
Um, I don't tend to use the word sex very much, but like the word spawn or behavior. Um, Because I'm English, I spell behavior the English way with a U in in it, um, and I I don't tag it the American way from pictures. I think search engines will deal with that quickly enough, um, you know, in in the future. You know, they're they're aware of those differences in the English language. But, yeah, actually, it's often better to actually type in the trunk of the word. So I often just type in B, you know, B-E-H-A-V. Um, yeah. And that's enough because that will find any behavior or yeah. behave or, you know, or behaving. Yeah. So, yeah. And the same with spawn. Rather than type spawning, type spawn. And then you'll get coral spawn. You'll get coral spawning, et cetera. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. That's at www.amustard.com. So thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'd like to thank um, Icolite um, for sponsoring this episode. Um, and I want to thank you all for watching. Um, please feel free to ask any questions in the comment section and to give us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.